The intellectual dark web was first named by the mathematician and physicist Eric Weinstein on Sam Harris's Waking Up podcast in January 2018. It attempted to join together an unlikely group of intellectuals and alternative media personalities, all the way from psychologist Jordan Peterson to podcaster and martial arts commentator Joe Rogan, figures from across the political spectrum, but all supposedly united by their willingness to have open and difficult conversations. The name stuck. Interest in the phenomenon quickly spread far and wide, with many thousands joining the conversation online. Welcomed by some, ridiculed by others, and even questioned by some in the group. It's like a herd of cats, right? <laughs> because, so I've thought about, well, what, what, what unites us to the degree that there's an us, because that's not so self-evident. There's enough of an us so that the name emerged and it's stuck. So, so there's something in common because otherwise the name wouldn't have stuck, right? You can't name nothing. It, it doesn't work. So what is the intellectual dark web? People in the group tend to reject orthodoxy, tend to reject ideology, tend to be interested in first principles thinking, meaning that uh, if you, you don't take something on faith. It's a very smart concept to try to corral a very difficult group of very disparate people into one um, orbit. I think everybody who's been described as a member of the, of the IDW probably has, among other things, one thing in common, which is they all are used to being howled at for saying things that are self-evident, howled at in public, only to then discover that the public come up to them in private and say, thank you so much for saying what we think. I would say it is actually the manifestation of the process of thinking that's more important than the conclusions that are generated. You need a group of people who are willing to say, hey, you know, you made a better point. I've changed my mind and I've learned something that I didn't think about. And that kind of um, integrity in a conversation is what characterizes uh, a lot of the internal IDW discussion to me. It's that people agree not on their positions, they may not even agree to what the facts are, but they usually agree as to what constitutes a conversation. The intellectual dark web seemed like something Eric Weinstein came up with on the spur of the moment, but it wasn't. It had been years in the making. Part of me wants to work uh, quietly, and part of me realizes that we have to work in some public-facing capacity. And I personally have found it much more comfortable to have a private life, um, to not have uh, everything that I'm thinking um, broadcast uh, to a large audience. But I think we've run out of time, and so um, I think some of us are somewhat reluctantly uh, choosing to make a, a different call now. I think that with the current administration and the White House, you're seeing a, a real discontinuity with the past, and it wasn't the discontinuity that I was hoping for. Uh, we had to break with the past, and I think that the way in which we are now breaking with the past is so destructive. Um, nobody knows what to believe, nobody quite knows what's true, nobody knows where to turn. Um, this is not a tenable situation, and so either we're going to descend into some kind of permanent chaos, or there's going to be, have to be something that we reboot from, and that thing cannot be simply left or simply right. And that's one of the reasons that the IDW is hopeful to me. This is the origin story of the IDW. What started off this path that I find myself on is that I was curious about certain things. I was curious about the world and I wanted to ask a bunch of questions about, well, really pretty much everything. And I find that if you keep asking why questions, you eventually either a, get tired, or B, become a theoretical physicist or mathematician. And so many of the deepest questions led to a kind of disciplined way of thinking about the world um, where we see all of the complexity in the world around us as being built up from very simple and beautiful patterns. And I think it was my desire to contribute to that story um, in particular with theoretical physics, 
that began my path. But at the time that I really emerged as an adult, uh, theoretical physics was in a great deal of difficulty and trouble. And I think as I came to understand that there was a big story that was going to affect everything that I cared about, it was going to affect the markets, it was going to affect our families, our sense of ourself, our security. And that story is the story of what happens when humans get addicted to high levels of broadly distributed, stable technology-led growth and then are denied the ability to continue on that path. That means that you're set up potentially for war, for civil unrest, uh, for uh, communism if people try to grab what their neighbor has, or fascism if people try to maintain order at all costs. I define this thing called an ego or an embedded growth obligation. And an embedded growth obligation is how fast a structure has to grow in order to maintain its honest positions. So if you have a situation in which you have um, trial lawyers and they're supported by various associates uh, and the associates all want to become partners uh, and trial lawyers themselves, then what you have is you have a situation where the law firm has to grow at a very fast clip if all those people are going to be uh, satisfied with their job decisions. Well, very quickly, that ability to grow runs out. And then people want to know, why am I stuck in a position going nowhere? Well, the same thing was happening in theoretical physics. It was happening in mathematics. It was happening in the pension funds. It was happening absolutely everywhere except for a small number of places like startups and hedge funds, which for a period of time were able to buck that trend. And as I came to understand that we were in some sort of society-wide Ponzi scheme since the late 60s, early 70s, and that there was no way to continue to grow our way out using the previous tools, um, I started to understand that society was going to be lying about almost everything at almost all times. And that's a very terrifying thought to have. We have effectively entered a period in which we cannot trust our experts. And I think that what began as a desire to contribute and to do real work ended with an understanding that we've got two generations of institutional experts that are corrupted and that we cannot wake up from this crazy fever dream that we're all in because we can't figure out who we can still trust. The doctors are compromised, the professors are compromised, the journalists are compromised, the politicians are compromised. About the only thing that isn't badly compromised are people with an independent source of sustenance. Individuals in very small groups are about the only thing that is free of this disease of the embedded growth obligation. And so the paradox is, is that the individuals have to save the institutions that are trying to extinguish them. Because the institutions don't want to hear this message. But in fact, if they don't make use of the tiny number of people functioning as individuals or in small organizations, all of this is going to collapse because it cannot continue uh, along its current e exponential path. That exponential gave out a long time ago, and it's like Wile E. Coyote running off of the cliff. As soon as he realizes that there's nothing holding him up, down we fall. There's two games here. There's trying to get the best deck chairs on the Titanic, and there's trying to rescue the ship. And in general, um, nobody can think of how to rescue the ship, which is a daunting task. So instead, what we're doing is we're fighting for position uh, in a losing game. And it's important that that stop. You've, you've talked about this phrase, the war on excellence. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a very counterintuitive or a very odd thing to be declaring war on. Well, yeah. Um, so it has to do with uh, excellence in and of itself isn't the problem. The problem is that we don't realize that excellence is a modality that is expensive. Um, when we pursue excellence, we usually pursue some activity that has very low variance. An excellent sprinter is going to be somebody whose times are usually very tight around uh, their personal best. Well, 
those low variance behaviors are at the cost of high variance behaviors. And most of what I think actually ends up moving the dial in human history is high variance human activity. So what is it that allows um, somebody who's as unreliable as Jim Watson of Double Helix fame to repeatedly uh, deliver outstanding discoveries? So you, you have a guy who you can't take to any party and on the other hand, uh, a giant chunk of uh, modern molecular biology is due to him and cellular biology. So y you have very high variance individuals who are maddening, they're difficult, they're unpleasant, they're time consuming, but they're able to play the far right tail of the distribution and bring us unbelievable wonders. So a famous example for me is Bill Shockley, who was a eugenicist, uh, kind of uh, a bit of a nutcase uh, with respect to certain ideas to, to many. On the other hand, you know, he was one of the prime reasons that we got the semiconductor and built an industry around it. And if you think about all of the things that are done with transistors, um, you know, a lot of them go back to Bill Shockley. Okay, well, are we willing to give up uh, our semiconductors uh, in order to protest Shockley's uh, excesses in, in, in the field of eugenics? I, I, in general, am not. I'm willing to tolerate a lot of eccentricity and difficult behavior and unpleasant people. And I think it's absolutely imperative that we realize that as a society, we are standing on the shoulders not only of giants, but of jerks, of un seemly people, very marginal individuals, who have nevertheless contributed much of the genius that undergirds uh, our modern productive society. And I think it's absolutely appalling that we don't even know our own history to know this uncomfortable relationship and how important it is to allow in high variance individuals into a world which now attempts to shut them out by claiming that we need excellence at all costs and highly agreeable people with very small variants. This is a, a one-way ticket to irrelevancy. Nature provides a lot of very difficult people who are very disagreeable with very high variances, particularly the learning disabled community has very high variances. And I believe that they're not eliminated, eliminated from the gene pool for a reason. I believe that they're there to be the innovators. And so we're killing our own innovative class with all of these extra requirements for collegiality or um, diversity or um, some kind of regularity. Because often everybody on the team has one idea and the idea that you need is the one guy who won't go along. So how do we get people who are, um, if you know the ash conformity experiment, ash negative, that is that they don't go along with what everybody's pretending to, to claim as their own perspective. On each card there are several lines your task is a very simple one. You're to look at the line on the left and determine which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. Two. 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 Uh, two. The subject denies the evidence of his own eyes and yields to group influence. We also want people who are Milgram negative. If you know the Milgram experiment with Stanley Milgram, if you make an error, however, you'll be punished with an electric shock. So, of course, it is to your advantage that you learn all these word pairs as quickly as possible. You want people who, when asked to push the bus buzzer to administer an electric shock, uh, tell the experimenter to buzz off rather than the people who go along with it when they're assured that they will not be held personally responsible. So, in part, you have to recognize that um, heroic behavior comes from a group of people who, in general, uh, are viewed as somewhat unsavory by the mainstream, and that's fine. What makes you so certain that those kind of individuals are not part of the establishment at the moment? Well, first of all, even where they are part of the establishment at the moment, they talk to us in hushed tones, like, oh, you don't know how, got, how bad it's gotten. I, I can't say that anymore. Fifteen years ago, I could say that. Now I could lose my job. Like, you're, you're actually... Those people are still there, but they're not free to think. Um, and the penalty for like a single misstep 
I mean, even imagine that you have a bad thought, you say a bad thing. Was well, that the end of your career? We're going to dispose of high ability people because they may, they told an off color joke in the wrong setting. Like that's insane. I, I don't know how to how to how to say it. Like you could have somebody who might be on the verge of a cure for cancer, and uh, if they told some joke um, that offended somebody's gender sensibilities, that person could be out of a job. Well, that's insane. I mean, it's very important to understand that level of intolerance, of, of fragility, has to be driven out of the institutions that require these high agency individuals. And is your sense that that process of um, excellence keeping out genius is actually a civilizational threat or is, is, is partly to do with the, the, the situation that we find ourselves in? Yeah, I mean, let's just um, let's just talk about disagreeability as a trait. Right now, we have all sorts of things that need people to say no to them and to point the way towards something else. No, we should not be um, pushing for citizenship for everyone in the, in the country who's here illegally. No, we should not be allowing uh, the claim that. Um, Islam is the religion of peace and therefore the least uh, close to any kind of violent act. Obviously, they've got a problem and we, they need our help and we need their help. We need to be talking about these things. Obviously, trade is extremely redistributive and to claim that it makes, that it makes a rising tide which raises all boats is malpractice for an economist to mouth those words. We need to clean house for people who are lying, obviously lying, about very simple things. Uh, and the only people who are likely to be those, the people who are going to say that, are going to be people who, with their own theories. They're going to be people who are highly disagreeable, highly creative, and somewhat self-destructive. We want those people rather than the, we have excellent people, and that's our problem. It's a plague. And it's not that excellence is bad, it's that we have way too many excellent people in proportion to the number of geniuses and heroes in the population. Sewell Wright um, was an evolutionary biologist and a beautiful analogy of this is called a fitness landscape. And his perspective was um, when you're doing things mostly right, uh, you can figure out how to do them a little bit better by figuring out what gets you a slightly better outcome with small variations. And so we, this was analogized to climbing a little hill of fitness. But if you imagine that fundamentally you're pretty close to the top and the really high uh, fitness peak is across a valley that you have to go down to go up, what does that feel like in terms of an innovator? Um, how does an innovator experience it? Well, um, you might see yourself maxing out your credit cards. You might see your relationship in tatters. Uh, you might see that you've overpromised and underdelivered, and you've got only two weeks to come up with a solution, and you've got nothing. The kinds of people who are willing to take on those sorts of assignments are going to be very frightening to the general population. And great, that's wonderful. We have to make sure that those people have a home in science, in startups in journalism, in sense-making, in anything innovative, so that fundamentally you don't get these levels of consensus around total nonsense that keep cropping up inside of the institutional framework. I think what, what they do is they construct very durable narratives about people who um, refuse to go along. So in general, when I hear the word consensus, my initial hit on the word consensus is negative. Why is that? It's because if everybody agrees that something is true, like two plus three equals five, you don't need a consensus. Nobody talks about the arithmetic consensus. Everybody who doesn't subscribe to the arithmetic consensus uh, goes nowhere. They can't build a house. They, they can't, uh, you know, handle money. Okay, so there's no need to call it the arithmetic consensus. On the other hand, um, if things are actually open-ended, 
very rare for people to all bunch together around one set of tentative ideas. So what you find is that in general you would expect a cacophony of people each with their own pet ideas when things are genuinely uncertain or you would find everybody falling in line when more or less it's clear that uh, that the world goes one particular way. So in general I think what's going on with a consensus is that a consensus is usually achieved through some sort of incentivizing people as the uh, as the mobs uh, the violent mobs in Mexico say plato o plomo do you want silver or do you want lead so you're given a certain amount of encouragement to come to a particular perspective maybe in terms of grant money or speaking opportunities and you're given a disincentive which is this is what's going to happen to your career if you don't fall in line and so using a plato o plomo model you suddenly get a lot of people pretending that they all agree to some kind of consensus position. Consensus thinking almost destroyed the financial system in 2008. Eric had been warning about the danger of mortgage-backed securities since 2002. I got very involved in economics, uh, tried to bring some of the discipline that came from theoretical physics and differential geometry uh, into neoclassical economic theory. We were some of the first people to become alarmed about the role of mortgage-backed securities and their ability to potentially blow up the world economic system. By 2008, it had become clear to everyone that uh, we had built a massive society-wide fiction, which uh, the mandarins had called the great moderation. And this is one of the things that gives me confidence that when large numbers of well-credentialed and well-spoken experts sitting in the most powerful positions in your society all agree on something, you should not be intimidated or cowed because what's quite possible is, is that groupthink has taken over the entire system. And after uh, 2009, when we held a conference at the Perimeter Institute, where we tried to bring in people from outside the financial community to look at the financial crisis. Welcome to the Economic Manhattan Project. I got a very good view of why and how the individual expert communities resist visitors from other fields, because the visitors from other fields don't have any allegiances. And the people who are in that particular field have built up to very defensive positions. So I, I got a chance to see, well, what happens when you bring mathematicians, computer scientists, theoretical physicists, um, corporate executives to look at the financial crisis? The guys who are actually doing finance get very freaked out and they circle the wagons. People sense that there's something about the incentive structures that makes the conclusions untrustworthy, even when the conclusions are right. And sometimes the conclusions of the consensus are right. That's not the issue. I think climate is a situation which my guess is, is that the climate consensus is probably correct in some sense. But many of us are very disturbed by our ability to see incentives pushing people to hold certain conclusions. So I think, I think that that structure is enforced by taking anyone who's outside of the consensus and attaching concepts to their name. So one of the experiments I tried was uh, controversial professor Paul Krugman versus controversial professor Jordan Peterson. Paul Krugman has been a controversial professor, professor for decades, but there wasn't a single hit on all of Google for the phrase controversial professor Paul Krugman because this is one of the tricks inside of what I've called the gated institutional narrative or the gin. So in the gin, the way it works is that you have these set phrases. Um, it could be a, you know controversial strongman uh, um, Bashar al-Assad. Okay, well, what is that telling us? It's the news media opining that we should be picking a side and that he should be on the opposite side. So when you have a situation where the news media wants to promote somebody like Paul Krugman, they don't call him controversial professor Paul Krugman. They call him New York Times columnist or Nobel laureate Paul Krugman. But if it's Jordan Peterson and Jordan hasn't signed up for some sort of consensus position, he has to be controversial professor Jordan Peterson. Now it's true that he's a controversial professor, 
but that's actually the gated institutional narrative's special language for telling the audience who the good guys and the bad guys are. And if you go back to professional wrestling, this would be called heels and baby faces or faces. And so the idea is that Paul Krugman would be a face and Jordan Peterson would be a heel, but instead of being open about the fact that wrestling is a simulated uh, performance sport, um, in the journalistic endeavor, we pretend that journalism is actually a search for truth, which I find hysterically funny. And you've described this as kayfabe in the past. So the right. People who, can you explain what that is to people who have maybe not heard that term? Sure. I, I think one of the problems is that we don't have good language for dealing with multi-layered deception. And the two places that I thought had pretty good language were the intelligence community and professional wrestling. So professional wrestling uh, was the easier, uh, it's hard to get spooks to give up their secrets. So what I did is I started to look into professional wrestling and um, what, is, what are all of the terms that they have to maintain to keep track what the actual storylines are, what the simulated storyline. Sometimes you have a simulated uh, storyline that apparently breaks into actual reality or like, like you're breaking the fourth wall, but it's actually a controlled structure where you're still in a fake story. So they call things that are fake works and they call things that are real shoots. So a, uh, a worked shoot uh, is actually something that is set inside of a fake storyline, is apparently real and breaks the fourth wall, but is in fact fake so you're talking about tertiary and eventually quaternary levels of deception. I don't think the human mind can do much more than four layers of lying. Um, but kayfabe is the organized structure of lies that undergirds professional wrestling and has uh, kept it as a simulated sport for about a century. All sorts of human activity um, veer between utter terror and boredom. And why is that? Well, because if something is actually an unbounded negative potential experience, people are very hesitant to engage. So if two wrestlers uh, can really do damage to each other, they're going to circle each other for a very long time before engaging because they don't want to risk anything that they don't have to. So you could have bouts that would go on for four or five hours and basically nothing happened. Um, well, this is true in all sorts of endeavors. People in the know in finance don't really want to risk their money. So they come up with all sorts of elaborate ways to make sure that they're going to be okay no matter what happens. Um, in politics, the same is true. Nobody wants to s simply find that they're out of a job uh, because they lost an election. So there's an elaborate s revolving door uh, between p politically related occupations like punditry um, or uh, lobbying uh, and actually being a representative. So you have all sorts of fakery that is entitled, that is uh, intended rather to make stable careers for the participants and to present an engaging and regular product for those in the audience. And so I believe that in some sense um, what you're seeing is what I call K fabrication, where real activities uh, that are dangerous and or boring tend to get sanitized uh, by the participants so that they can pre present an as-if product uh, to, to those outside of the structure and not themselves get hurt and continue to make money off of it. And I think that that's what happened in professional wrestling. There's a real competition for airtime, for, for fame, but there's a fake competition, which is a scripted series of uh, pretend bouts where the decisions are actually known in advance. And that's very similar to what I see happening in war, in finance, uh, in media, and particularly journalism. I think you've spoken before about the sense that these systems get weaker and weaker as they continue. Why do you think that is? Which systems? Well, the political system, for example. Um, that It seems that as time has gone on, the, the choices that we're being given in the political system get weaker and weaker. Well, because you're driving, you're systematically driving out uh, the people who should be trying to lead. You're making it so unpleasant to hold real opinions, to have real integrity. You're driving the costs of the specific group of people we need so that instead the only people who are going to show up are the people that we should fear most.
there was the New York Times article that, that came out and kind of named the IDW. Is there a kind of paradox in that it's no longer dark? Well, it was never dark, and that was a, a large part of the joke. Um, we have only been dark to one thing, and that thing is the institutional media and the main platforms, be they academic or governmental. So, uh, if you will, I think that the mainstream media has pretended not to notice us, as just as they pretended to find it, everything we say either vapid or outrageous. But I think that you know what, what's really going on is that there's been a monopoly effectively on narrative held by the collection of major institutional voices. The true spectrum of thought is far broader than um, people have been led to believe. And I think that's where the IDW comes in, that we are, it's not that we're just outside of the Overton window. Many of the points we're making really aren't found anywhere inside of uh, mainstream media and established institutions, even though many of these things that we are talking about are simply commonplace observations. Did you have any doubts about that New York Times article? I mean, I had, uh, I had an infinite number of doubts about the New York Times article. Part of me wants to work uh, quietly, and part of me realizes that we have to work in some public-facing capacity. And I personally have found it much more comfortable to have a private life, um, to not have uh, everything that I'm thinking um, broadcast uh, to a large audience. But I think we've run out of time, and so um, I think some of us are somewhat reluctantly uh, choosing to make a, a different call now. So you're, you're talking about a different way of thinking, people who have a different way of thinking. Is that what characterizes the members of the IDW? It's hard to say. I mean, I would say that everybody in the IDW is fairly disagreeable in the sense of big five personality inventory. So can you hold a position when you're the only person in a room that believes that thing? Like if it's you versus 100 people. I would say almost everybody in the core of the IDW uh, is capable of holding a position where everyone is against you. And I think that that trait is extremely rare. Do you see the IDW as primarily a political project? No, I don't. I, I see it primarily as a precursor to anything decent. It's what has to succeed for us to have a political conversation. I don't think we're having a political conversation, uh, either internationally or nationally. I think we have people who are talking about nonsense positions. We just went back to the immigration position. There are only two positions I'm convinced aren't political. One is open borders, which is never going to happen, and the other one is closed borders, which is never going to happen. And yet, you very often encounter people who are talking in these terms as if... Um, these are the actual positions. So I don't think that we're having a political conversation. I think that what's been going on is, is that the mainstream media has been playing keep away ball, right? So this game where you're throwing the ball over somebody who's trying to catch it. Now the public has been trying to get in on this conversation, but what keeps happening is, is that our fake left and our fake right are engaged in a completely fake conversation about fake items, including fake news, which they themselves are pushing out and then claiming to fight fake news. So the whole thing is so saturated in falsehood um, that people are waking up to the idea, oh, I've forgotten what it sound, sounded like for people to actually have a discussion about a topic and how much time it takes. Uh, you know, in general, it can't be done with uh, four or five voices on a panel in 10 minutes with a few commercial interruptions. There's just almost nothing can be discussed that way. And what's, what's worse is that the very people who would be best able to discuss it are never going to be invited onto those programs. In a way, the people in the IDW have been selected for, like a lot of them have had quite high profile encounters. You, you look at um, Sam Harris with Ben Affleck, or you look at Brett Weinstein. Um, and there, there's a sense that they've in some way had to live out their ideas. There's a sense of bravery that they've had to stick up for themselves. Jordan Peterson and C16, I mean, you, could, you can list a lot of times where, as you said, they had to be that one person who was thinking a certain thing. You no, know, I mean, I think I made the point, probably on the Rubin Report, that what's going on is that when you ask any large collection of people to salute a nonsensical flag and pledge allegiance to it, 
And more or less everyone makes the calculation, I guess if this is going to get me through my day, I'll salute any flag. Then you've got the one gal or one guy who doesn't want to. Well, my observation is that that person is usually sitting on an entire mountain of interesting thoughts that they don't have the freedom to simply make a convenience readjustment. And so from that perspective, yeah, in general, if you ask a uh, thousand people to salute a flag that makes no sense and tell them that they'll be incentivized, you'll get a thousand dollar check at the end or you, know, you won't lose your job, and somebody stands up and says, no way, I'm getting out of here, do what you want. That person is usually much more interesting than just being a contrarian. That person is usually saying no because they've got an entire worldview that is uh, built by hand and, and, and bespoke. And so that's why this method of finding people has been relatively fruitful. It's people who don't back down usually don't back down for a reason because there's every reason just to go along. It seems that the, the phenomena of the IDW is, is part of this great intellectual awakening. I mean, you're seeing people being really hungry for long-form content on YouTube, three-hour conversations. People are, are clearly hungry for a lot more intellectual stimulation. I don't, than I don't actually agree with this. I mean, this is an idea that um, I think Jordan has slightly wrong. Uh, so uh, for a while, I've been making the point that there was a change between um, writing for television was sort of the lowest form of, uh, uh, of an art and that writing for movies allowed for real character development, but that the um, multi-season, multi-episode shows with very long storylines actually has the greatest character development and so the, the greatest writers are now writing for TV the important thing to understand is, is that it's not just the advent of long-form podcasting. What it is, is having the courage to say something using that medium. You have long-form podcasts that aren't attracting almost anybody. And the only reason that the IDW uh, is behaving in a different fashion is that it's mar marrying the content that brave people are starved for with the change in technology. And so in general, most things don't work in a three hour format. What works in a three hour format is when you're living through what I'm calling left Carthyism, where the modern left, which is my side of the aisle, has gone so completely insane that people are starved for normal conversation as if it was some as that in the former Soviet Union. And so you have an underground network, if you will, um, that is supplying that need for reality. Uh, and the only reason we're underground is because the mainstream is pretending, for the most part, not to notice that this phenomenon is existing, which is fascinating. And you've described this as a civil war within the left. Could you, could you explain what you mean by that? Sure. The left that I relate to is the left that realizes that the past cannot supply the answers and that we have to actually progress because we can't stay here. It is not the left that believes we can wish ourselves into a beautiful future by pretending that the, re that the world is different than it actually is. So I, I think that the key thing that it, it is an agreement between these two groups is that we have to get to some sort of better place, and that is the, the progressive in progressivism. Where we are deeply divided, and you know, again, these are the divisions that are is much worse than between left and right. Um, how these absolutely imbecilic figures believe that you can just wish yourself into paradise, that you don't have to worry about markets, that you can just say, you know, free good things for everybody. Well, it just doesn't make a whit of sense. Or, you know, you're going to wish human beings to be both simultaneously non-diverse so that you can argue that any difference in pro rata shares of a group uh, in any occupation is evidence of oppression. And then you're going to turn around and argue that people are actually incredibly different because we're going to get a huge benefit from diversity. I mean, this is not even self-consistent. This is 
this would be offensive to an, an intelligent five-year-old. So I don't really believe that these progressives, uh, as they call themselves, and regressives as some of us call them, uh, are even making serious intellectual points. They're sort of trolling by pretending to believe in all things um, that just gum up the works. And so it's very important to me that not only do we not really spend time debating people who are not serious in their intellectualism, but that we realize that it is important to the diversity of mature and important ideas that we not spend undue effort engaging uh, ideas that are functioning very differently from regular conversation. It is as if um, somebody asks, should we have a diverse dinner tonight? Well, we could invite somebody from this position, from that country, from this gender, and then should we, should we invite a suicide bomber? Well, if you're a suicide bomber, you're, that bit of diversity is going to take down the entire conversation as well as all the people at the table. Right? Well, these are like suicide bombers in terms of their ideas. They are attaching themselves to real conversations and blowing up the conversation so that you can't actually speak. And I think what we need is we need to realize that the diversity of ideas that have to be explored um, hinges on not allowing in bad diversity. That is, you don't want a single person at the table who wants to scuttle the conversation. And that's not something that we've understood about the modern left. The modern left is very often focused on scuttling any realistic conversation so that it can continue to threaten and terrorize people into pretending to hold positions that no sane person could possibly hold. Why do you think it's become like this? Well, I think my wife probably has the best explanation, which is that... Uh, when you're actually dependent on labor for your voter base, labor has economic issues. So this is the great search for something cheaper than labor. And identity turns out to be much cheaper than labor. If you can get somebody to vote for you uh, where you're going to take uh, their future, their security, and their retirement, but you're going to celebrate the fact you know, that they came from Laos, um, that's a bad deal. Nothing against the Laotians, but for God's sake, stand up for yourself as a worker before you, you know, stand up for yourself as uh, somebody who needs to see Southeast Asia celebrated on the national stage. It's not that exciting. Demand more from from uh, your representatives. This is the great search for the cheapest possible constituency, and that's exactly why I think it's happening. I think it's because um, the traditional Democratic voter base. Um, was too expensive. They wanted real change. They wanted to participate economically. They wanted to participate at the level of power. Um, and the, the donor base said, Is there, isn't there anything cheaper than labor? And they, I think they found something. And where do you hope that this IDW conversation will go in the future? Well, I hope it goes to the heart of everything that is... Um, denying our ability to use our eyes and our ears and our minds as decent people. If you're simply observing the world as it is and you're thinking about it with a big open heart and you're trying to be decent about it at the same time that you're trying to provide for your family and concerned about your country's welfare, uh, there's no reason that you should be huddling uh, in the cupboard afraid that uh, if anyone hears that you think that men are different from women uh, that you're going to be consigned to the dustbin of history and fired for it. It's re absolutely essential that people stop being terrorized for holding garden variety positions.